<laughs> Thanks, David. Um, we have a new energy initiative here on campus. A lot of you have heard about joint with the business school and the law school. I am sort of the minder of the fences behind the, over here at the business school. And then Melinda Taylor, who's over here in the front row, if you could wave, Melinda, is leading the charge in the law school. So the two of us are trying to organize all of our energy activities going forward. Um, we're very lucky today to have Professor David Spence with us. And one of the interesting things being a professor is that you have to explain to people what you do, right? You, nobody really understands what we do around here. It's a strange thing. And so my father was a professor. And when I was a little kid, I said, so you teach a lot. And he said, I do teach. He said, that's very important. But what I'm really trying to do is write textbooks, right? I'm trying to sort of manage what it is that we teach. Because teaching's hard, but it's even harder to write the next textbook. And so. I got to college, I was taking classes, and I said, oh, I'm taking a class from a professor who wrote the textbook. And my dad said, well, I told you that when you were little because it was easy to understand. What's really hard about being a professor is not writing the textbook, but writing the theory that lets someone write the next textbook. Like, what is this cutting edge next thing that we're going to worry about? That's really what we're trying to do here, in addition to teaching and writing those textbooks. And the reason we're lucky to have Professor Spence is he's done all three, all right? David has a JD from the University of North Carolina and a PhD from Duke, which makes it very difficult during basketball season, but he's well-educated, so that's good, right? He also was a practicing attorney, right? Not a lot of faculty actually had a real job. We aren't sure how all this works, timeliness and things like that. David did, so that's good. He is also one of the leading scholars in energy law, right? So not just someone who practiced law, he's leading the new theory. He has also published probably the most popular energy law textbook. So he has the theory, he's got the textbook, and he's an award-winning teacher. He teaches in all of our most important programs, executive and otherwise, and his MBA elective in energy law is one of the most popular. He is also one of the few, if probably the only faculty member in McCombs who is also licensed to teach in the law school. So he literally can do it all. And probably most interesting or most fun about working with David is it to quote his department chair from our newest uh, department in McCombs, Business, Government, and Society, which is doing a lot of policy and energy work inside of McCombs. Robert Prentice is down in front, and he said to quote, he's also as nice a guy as you'd ever want to meet. So with no further ado, I'll introduce David Spence. Thank you very much. Thanks, John, for that. Um, can you hear me? Is my mic working? Thanks, John, for that wonderful introduction. Most of that is true, but some isn't. Uh, uh, and also, thank you uh, to the K. Bailey Hutchinson Center for uh, sponsoring us today, to Dave Wenger and Gail Height for organizing this event. Um, I appreciate all the work that went into this. And lastly, to all of you for showing up here today. We're still working on getting this all squared away here. but. Uh, it's very gratifying, thank you. It's very gratifying to see um, so many people coming out to hear about and talk about and think about energy policy issues. I see a lot of uh, former students. I see friends from our electricity conference that we hold each year. I see friends from other parts of the university. And I know from looking at the list that there are a lot of people from the community who are just uh, here because they're interested in the topic. Uh, and so um, th that's, great to that's great to hear. I'm going to, because energy policy is such a broad topic, I'm going to try and finish plenty early so that we have time to talk about whatever you'd like to talk about in that field. What I'm going to talk about today is a fairly narrow topic uh, concerning energy politics and one particular dynamic that goes on in energy politics. As John said, I teach energy law. I also teach a course that's sort of an energy politics course. Uh, when I think of energy law, I think of two things. Uh, the set of rules that govern the production of energy, mainly environmental health and safety rules, and the set of rules that govern the sale of an delivery and sale of energy, mainly economic and price regulation. Uh, and it's important to me that, my, that our, my students understand those rules, how they work. My students in the law school in particular need to know how to use them to uh, represent their clients. My students in the business school need to understand those rules because they provide the context in which they do business. Some of the students will go on to represent clients who they're, who, uh, whose positions they are advocating out in the world. Some of them will, rep will be government relations people. Uh, and so the topic for today, this, this notion of bias and how it influences the way we perceive energy policy problems is directly relevant to them in their jobs because they're trying to persuade. But for the rest of us and for most people, 
uh, this issue of bias is really about trying to get an, a, a, an understanding of what's true in energy policy and what's not true. And, and that's, that can be difficult because there's all, always people trying to influence you to try and bring you over to their view of what the facts are. And so um, that's what I'd like to talk a, a little bit about today. Is this, is this too, too loud or is this good? Good? Okay. It feels loud to me, but um, that's okay. All right, so we're gonna delve into some of these uh, issues, particularly as it relates to the way we perceive risk because uh, energy policy is, uh, is often about risk and managing risk. Uh, particularly the regulation of energy production side of energy law is about that primarily. And so uh, we'll talk about how, uh, how bias can influence the way we perceive risks uh, and manage those risks. So that's where we're going. Um, this is, uh, this, these are ideas, or what I'm gonna talk about today is a, is a narrow subset of ideas that come from a larger literature that probably a lot of you have already, are already familiar with. It's extremely influential now in many academic fields. Uh, comes mainly from psychology, but also sociology, anthropology, neurosciences. Uh, sometimes goes by the name behavioralism or the behavioral revolution. That may be a little bit of a misnomer, but uh, the, the point is that it's about, uh, it's a, it represents a body of work that uh, tries to chronicle, identify the systematic ways in which we are sometimes not rational in our thinking and our decision making. So uh, it stands in contrast to sort of the model that economists use of, of rational actors pursuing their self-interest uh, and the, the work that comes out of this psychologicals and, uh, and, and related fields uh, is mainly experimental research uh, that has documented the ways in which we sometimes are not that way. And some of those, some of that behavioral research, some of that experimental research uh, is, is related to the ways in which we perceive risk. Uh, we call it the behavioral revolution. It says here, I said earlier, and I, I hinted that that might not be an accurate moniker. People in some fields would say that, you know, they would use the, the word behavioral to mean something a little broader or different from the way we're using it here. Here we're using it to refer to this, trying to identify the way people actually behave as opposed to the way we assume they might behave within economic models. The word revolution might not be right either. This is, a, we, this is, is an area of research that's exploded in, in, in volume and influence in the last 30 years or so, but it dates back much further than that. Uh, people have been talking about departures from rationality and how we make decisions, you know, all the way back even before World War II, although we tend to think of it as mostly post-World War II uh, research. So uh, many of you may know that Daniel Kahneman won a Nobel Prize for this work, but so did Herbert Simon long before doing, doing sort of work that, rep that is really the ancestor of the work that Daniel Kahneman is doing. So I'm going to pull a few ideas out of that literature. For those of you that have read some of these popular books that summarize it, they're very interesting. They're fascinating. They cover all sorts of fields, not just energy policy, not just politics and policy, but uh, all sorts of other uh, areas in which decision our decisions and our decision processes are important and interesting. So we're using the word bias in our, in our title. Uh, you're biased and I'm not. Um, here's the dictionary definition of bias, at least the Merriam-Webster dictionary definition. And you can see from the definition that um, it includes the no notions of emotion, feeling, uh, the notion that, that we can be uh, uh, not open to persuasion, not open to rational persuasion. Uh, tendency, trend, inclination, feeling, or opinion, especially one that's preconceived or unreasoned. So we're looking at uh, a phenomenon that has an emotional component to it. Um, and for those of you that studied this way back when, it, maybe you took a psychology class and you heard about, you learned about cognitive dissonance. That's an idea that goes back to 1920-something uh, in psychology. The notion that uh, we uh, we feel we feel a discomfort when we have to juggle two opposing ideas. There's a very famous quotation from F, from F. Scott Fitzgerald, uh, which I'll probably uh, mess up as I try to paraphrase it, but the idea is something to the effect that, you know, the, I, that trying to hold in mind simultaneously two opposing ideas is extremely difficult. He says that if we can do that and retain the ability to function, 
uh, then we've made a tremendous uh, accomplishment. It's, it's a, we are wired to try to relieve that discomfort somehow, to rationalize. Some of you also may remember the film The Big Chill, uh, in which Jeffrey Goldblum's character says that we need to rationalize. It's important to us to rationalize every day. It's important to us to our health. So this, it's this, this is a human impulse to want to rationalize when we face these, these sort of inconsistent views. And um, what I like to do is trace some of the ways in which that uh, happens uh, in energy policy. Um, let me see if I can work my machine here. Uh, okay. I want to talk about two, I want to use two examples from energy politics and policy right now. I said the subtitle of this talk is about separating the politics from the policy or separating the politics from the law. Um, I want to talk about uh, a couple of hot button issues that we see in the news all the time and about which people feel strongly uh, and which are on the what I would call the production, regulation of production side of energy law. So we're putting aside the economic regulation for now. And we're going to talk about uh, two sets of issues. One, which has been euphemistically called the war on coal. This is the set of federal regulations of relatively recent vintage, although their origins aren't necessarily recent. Uh, Obama EPA and other administra federal administration rules that restrict emissions from coal-fired power plants, and, and some restrict uh, coal mining as well. Uh, these have been called the war on coal, which is a na name that reflects the intensity of feeling people have about it. Um, the other set of issues I'd like to talk about is uh, those that govern or that relate to local efforts to ban hydraulic fracturing. I think probably this is a pretty savvy group, but maybe not everybody knows what hydraulic fracturing is. It's the process by which we force fluids, sand, and chemicals down into rock layers that contain hydrocarbons that would otherwise be locked in the rock to fracture the rock to create space for the hydrocarbons to escape to the surface so we can produce oil and gas from that rock layer, usually shale. So I want to talk about both of those. You read about them all the time. The EPA rules are the subject of litigation all the time. The state of Texas has been a party to most of that litigation. Uh, the Fracking bans are popping up all over the country. My little logo here talks about the Denton fracking ban. Denton, Texas, as you all, maybe many of you know from reading the paper, passed one such ban last year. And uh, in all the local governments, all the municipalities where these bans are being established or regulations are being established, they raise a question of whether the state oil and gas law preempts the local ban. And so these provoke fights, both of these sets of issues provoke fights. And in each case, you have uh, a community of a relatively small group of people who are intensely interested in the fight. They may be people that have economic interests. They may be people who live near the land use that they're complaining about and uh, feel intensely about the, in the issue. Uh, and then around them, you have sort of, you have a continuum of interest moving from those you know, super interested people to other people who, you know, they, maybe they've heard about it, maybe they have an inclination, but they don't know that much about it, all the way to people who haven't heard about it, know nothing about it, and for whom the issue is not salient at all. But all those people, all those sets of people matter in the fight over the issue. Uh, let me explain what I mean by that. So here's a picture of the two policy processes. This is kind of a busy diagram, but it, you can ignore the, the small print here. What I'm just trying to do is show you where the action is, where these policies are being created and, 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 and how that has generated opposition and fights, political fights over the policy. So they're different in this respect. Even, the, the, even though they have many of the same characteristics, they're different in that one of these fights is mainly at the federal government level. It's, the, it's a federal agency, EPA, uh, creating rules mainly under the Clean Air Act, but not exclusively under the Clean Air Act, uh, to regulate the emissions of pollutants from coal-fired power plants, uh, particulate matter, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, other precursors of ozone, mercury, and greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide. Uh, and uh, the other issue is really taking place at the local level. It's an, it involves the interaction between local governments and states. So really the actors in the fracking fights are municipal uh, leaders, town councils, city councils, county commissioners. These are the people who are 
making the first line decisions that are provoking all of this opposition. Uh, but in both cases, it's, you have the very interested parties working very hard to influence the, the votes of the less interested or uninterested parties. And of course, the reasons may be intuitively obvious to you. Uh, if you can persuade the median voter, you can persuade the average voter that your side, your understanding of the problem is correct, then you're going to be more influential. Uh, it depends on the, the scenario here, but obviously in the lower part of the slide, the municipal ban scenario, if you can persuade a 50% plus one in the town that frack, fracking ought to be banned or fracking ought to not be banned, if you, whoever persuades that median voter is gonna win is going to influence the, the municipal leaders who are uh, typically, when it comes to these fracking issues, highly responsive to public opinion because by the time it comes to a vote, everybody cares about it within the town. And so that effort to persuade the, un the less interested about the dangers, the risks of fracking uh, is constant and often ferocious. Uh, at the top level, it's a little bit less clear that Persuading voters can, makes you influential. The EPA is not elected. They are not elected officials. Uh, they are responsive to uh, their political overseers in a sort of vague way or a general way, um, but they're not, uh, they're not directly responsive to voters. They don't have to be elected. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there's a lot of research that shows that agencies, and for that matter also courts, do pay attention to public opinion. There's an old saying that the Supreme Court follows the polls. Um, that's true of agencies as well. Uh, we see that in these fields, many of these regulatory fields, agencies will float proposed policies and sort of see what the public thinks about them and then uh, pull back if there's an outcry of, sort of too much of an outcry from, from, from a majority of people. So they tend to be somewhat, uh, although less directly, uh, in, influenced by public opinion. So these are sort of the two sets of issues here, the two policy processes that are generating a lot of heat, have generated a particularly hyperbolic and shrill debate uh, in the press. Uh, even the phrase war on coal is a you know, pretty strong phrase. Uh, and that de public debate stands in contrast to uh, the, the debate among experts about what the actual risks are. If you go to scientific conferences about the risks associated with uh, either of these two sets of issues, you get a much more circumspect discussion, much narrower, much more careful uh, characterization of the risks. And so the gap between those two often frustrates people. I imagine that frustration might have led some people to come to this talk today, just to sort of think about why that gap exists. Okay. Um, before I come back to the risks, I want to talk a little bit about the risks of each of these, uh, each of these uh, types of activities, coal-fired power and fracking, and what the scientific community has to say about all that in a second. But before we do that, it's important to, to recognize that uh, we're, risk is not the same thing as uncertainty, and then both are present in both of these policy arenas. So you have a mass of people that might not know a whole lot about this. You have a small group of people that might, have a, might know a lot about it and have an opinion. Um, and might want to characterize the risks to try and influence others. They're trying to persuade. But you also have uncertainty that's present. If risk is the probability of harm times the magnitude of the harm, we could think of risk that way, right? Uh, we, can, we can make a distinction between situations where we know that pretty well, both the probability and the harm pretty well. We may have a body of epidemiological literature that tells us what happens to people when they breathe in these pollutants. And we may have a pretty good idea of how many people are gonna breathe them in if we emit this certain amounts of them. Um, then that's a relatively low level of uncertainty. We are able to characterize the risk there. But there are other fields in which we don't know much about the harm yet, uh, or we're still learning about the harm. And we may not even know much about the, the probability of it individuals will experience the harm if we take a particular course of action. So we have to make a distinction between those two things. Um, and sometimes we can't confirm the harm or we, have, don't, we don't yet know what, what the harm is or what the probability of harm will be. When we, don't, when we have a lot of uncertainty about something, attempts by lobbyists or others or politicians or others who want to persuade you to characterize the risk in a certain way 
is you know, misleading when we don't really know what the risk is. If we do know what the risk is, and someone tries to characterize it in a way that's inconsistent with what the sort of weight of scientific opinion says it is, then they're misleading you. Right? They're misleading you in that situation. There's a distinction between those two things. So um, we could think about the risk profile of fracking and the risk profile of coal-fired power plants as being filled in over time as we study it. I'm using these, this picture of a pointillist painting, the most, perhaps the most famous pointillist painting, A Sunday Afternoon on Le Grand Jatte. How many have seen this painting? Uh, it's in the Chicago Art Institute. It's uh, fun to, to go view it there because you have to enter the room. It's a big painting, and you have to enter the room from the other side of the room. And when you enter from the other side of the room, it looks a lot like any other sort of impressionist painting. But as you walk toward it, you see that it is composed of nothing but dots. And as you get cl if you get too close, you can't make out the shapes anymore. It's just dots. Um, you can think of the filling in the risk profile of any sort of industrial activity that's new as kind of like filling in the dots on a pointillist painting. We don't, that's the best picture I could come up with on the left of, a, of uh, the beginnings of a pointillist painting. Um, we, it takes a while, it takes study, it takes time to identify what the harms are, to really characterize them, and you know, it, it can take decades to really get a sense of what the risk is. Uh, and you can, we can look back in history and look at other industries that have been around for long, uh, longer periods of time to, get a, to sort of see that in progress. The automobile industry in its early years, very dangerous. Uh, in 1921, we had uh, 24 fatalities per 100 million vehicle miles traveled. In, in 2013, we have 1.1 fatality per 100 million vehicle miles traveled. And the reason is, in between those, time, those periods of time, we learned an awful lot about where the risks were. Some of that learning was from, from automobile manufacturers who voluntarily instituted the use of turn signals and early seat belts and things like that. Some of it came from regulators. By the 1960s, we were regulating automobile safety and ratcheting, uh, ratcheting up the uh, safety even more. So over time, you move from that sort of low information environment to a higher information environment. And when you have more information, you can do a better job of, uh, hmm, better job of um, identifying and quantifying the risk. Same is true in the electricity industry. If anybody here has read the history of the electricity industry, um, you know that in the, you know, one of the first people to have his home wired up with electricity was J.P. Morgan. And not long after he had it wired up, he had a fire in his drawing room, or one of his many rooms, <laughs> in his mansion in New York City, because the wiring wasn't handled properly. We didn't know how to, how to do the wiring properly at that time, and so the wires in, uh, underneath his wallpaper started burning. Um, and it wasn't until, uh, I think, the uh, 19, around 1920 or 19-teens when we finally had the International Association of Electrical Engineers developed codes for things like wiring, transmission lines, distribution lines, wiring, generation, all that stuff. I mean, it used, we used to manage electricity in a much less safe way than we do now, but it, we learned from experience. And so that's the trajectory that, that our understanding of risk takes when we have new industries. Uh, the degree to which we understand risks in the two industries or the two policy debates that I'm talking about today uh, differ a little bit. They're similar in some ways, but they differ a little bit. Let's talk about fracking first. So I've tried to summarize on this slide sort of the major categories of risks that may be associated with hydraulic fracturing that are experienced by people near and far to uh, hydraulic fracturing operation. Um, a lot of these risks are things we're learning about. There's a lot of people doing uh, systematic studies of these risks. A lot of, a lot of them are here at the University of Texas. Um, and a lot of them are being operated here out of, or managed here at, uh, out of Austin by the Environmental Defense Fund, who's, doing a, who's sponsoring a series of studies on methane leakage, for example. But we have people studying seismology, earthquakes, people studying other air pollutants. We have people studying water use, water pollution, uh, and so on. Um, 
in the sort of life cycle trajectory of identifying the risks associated with fracking, we're still pretty early in that, in that curve, that learning curve. Uh, there's certain things we, we know we're going to see when there's a hydraulic fracturing operation, and those are the, the neighborhood effects that are sort of highlighted here. Those, those are fairly simple and straightforward. They're always, almost always going to be present. You're going to have a lot of trucks in the neighborhood. You're going to have a lot of noise. You're going to have compressors. You're going to have engines. You're going to have an industrial use where you didn't used to have one. But as far as these other risks are concerned, we're still learning about them. Yet you have people, if you're interested in this issue and you follow it, you have people trying to tell you that they know what those risks are already. Uh, and uh, you, have to, you have to try to decide whether what they're saying is right or wrong. Um, but I, I can tell you that if you go to a fracking conference, not so much anymore, I think they finally stopped, stopped this, but if you go to a fracking conference, uh, nowadays, you hear extreme and confident, uh, sorry, in the, in the last few years, you, I've often heard extreme and confident predictions on both sides of the, of the fence on these issues. On the one hand, you'll hear someone say, we've done a million fracking jobs in this country with not one single example of well contamination. That's not true. Um, it may be true that it's rare, quite rare, to contaminate a well uh, in, in, in connection with a fracking operation. And we have done many tens of thousands of them in the last few years. But it's not true that we've not contaminated any wells at all. On the other side, you have movies like Gasland that, that invite you to infer that the risks of fracking are much greater than, they, than we, at least science tells us they are at this point. So you, hear, you have this hyperbole on both sides of the line. And when, when there's a lot of uncertainty, as there is in this case, we're susceptible to, persuade, to this type of persuasion, this attempt to make demands on our beliefs about what the facts are. We like to think of our policy choices as being the product of reasoning. We first we understand what the facts are, then our differences are really based on different judgments we make about the facts. Well, sometimes when there's a lot of uncertainty, we have, we have the causal arrow going in the other direction. We have people trying to use our biases to, con to sort of convince us that the facts are what they would like us to believe the facts are. In the case of coal combustion, uh, we have a much longer record of um, study, um, at least in terms of identifying the harms and the nature of the harms. And I'm focusing on the air pollution here. That's why the lower part of this figure is in gray. I didn't want to omit the lower part of the figure just to give you a full flavor of all the new rules that the coal industry is being subjected to. But we have a much better sense of what the harms are associated with these uh, these air pollutions, particu pollutants, particularly the conventional pollutants and the toxics like mercury, we have a pretty good idea. We can estimate anyway pretty well the, the level of mortality that is associated with exposure to these harms, at least uh, on a mass basis. Uh, and we're, you know, we have a pr we have pretty good re source receptor models that tell us if we emit the pollutants in point A, you know, we can on an aggregate basis, do a pretty good job of understanding how many people are going to be exposed to those pollutants. Uh, so it's not, there's not as much uncertainty in this field as there is in fracking when it comes to characterizing the risks. We still have all kinds of debates about you know, how, how we measure costs and benefits and other elements of these rules. But when it comes to characterizing the risks, we know a lot better about some of these, these pollutants than we do about the effects of of fracking. Uh, when it comes to climate change and greenhouse gases, we have, uh, as I'm sure everybody in this room knows, what, what scientists would call a, a consensus, although it's not 100% consensus, so I guess it depends on your definition of consensus, but we have a strong consensus in favor of the notion that human activity is driving climate change, uh, less consensus over what the precise impacts of uh, climate change will be and how they will be distributed. Okay, so uh, so what people are trying, what's going on now is that people are trying to persuade you to be not only to choose uh, a policy or a policy approach or a poly posi policy position that they'd like you to hold, so that you will support their position when when it comes down to you know, voting in an election or pressuring agencies. Um, but they're also trying to influence your beliefs about what is true, about what the risks actually are. 
And that's where a lot of the lobbying happens now in these two, in these two policy debates. People are making demands on our beliefs about what the facts are. They're trying to help us frame, they're trying to help us, and I put help in quotes, by framing our understanding of these risks so that we will be led to the conclusion that their position is the right position. And it happens on both sides of this debate. And let me give you um, some examples. So for, I said frame, framing, frame, fr of, of the literature I referenced earlier out of, of sort of psychology and neuros, the neurosciences um, has done a lot of work on um, how the brain builds associations between different cognitions or ideas that it stores. Uh, it actually builds neural connections between ideas that are sometimes uh, encountered together. So for example, if, the, if you have no exposure to the oil and gas industry and the only time you think about oil and gas is when you read about the Exxon Valdez spill or the Deepwater Horizon spill, you're gonna, you're, you're gonna store your, you know, the, the, the concept of the oil industry together with the concept of spills, for example. If you, on the other hand, you have a lot of exposure to the oil and gas industry and you uh, have a, a, a fuller context of how they behave, uh, you might not make that association as directly or as carefully, or as, or as fully rather. Um, so there's a contest to sort of make certain aspects of these issues more salient to voters than others. Uh, and some of that involves um, appeals to fear. Those can be particularly powerful. Um, and they involve, often involve not, not data, but stories. My friend and colleague John Daly likes to say, a good story beats data every time. And so the methods by which people try to persuade us are often stories. Uh, and if we want to be resistant to sort of uh, the appeals to our biases, these are leverages, they're trying to leverage our biases, leverage what we know about how the brain works to persuade us in ways that may not reflect uh, what the science tells us about risk. Let me give you a couple of examples. So I'm going back to the history of electricity again. Way back in the day, in the early days of electricity, there was a fight or a debate over whether the grid and distribution systems ought to be alternating current systems or direct current systems. And the two main players in this debate were Thomas Edison who owned and installed the direct current systems and uh, Westinghouse who owned and installed the alternating current systems. And those of you who are uh, fans of Nikola Tesla, Tesla worked for Westinghouse and had sort of really uh, illustrated to the satisfaction of most of the experts that alternating current systems were superior in a variety of ways. But Edison didn't want to go down without a fight, so he tried to, uh, uh, tried to create associations in the public mind of alternating current systems with danger. And he did it in a number of ways. One of the ways he did it was to lobby for uh, alternating current to be used in the electric chair so that executions would be associated with alternating current and that we would, set, we would get a feel for alternating current as being dangerous. Another way he did it is by uh, holding public sort of spectacles where he would electrocute and kill large mammals, dogs, uh, an elephant. Uh, these were sort of, uh, I don't know if this is where Dog and Pony Show came from, um, but uh, he would do this. He would go around and try to create public attention to the dangers of alternating current by electrocuting these animals in public. In fact, there's a play called Edison's Elephant, which you might encounter sometime. It's about this time in our history. He was trying to create associations in our mind that would steer us toward favoring his system over that of Westinghouse. Here's another attempt to create an association. Um, an ad, billboard, billboard ad run by the Heartland uh, Institute uh, associating belief in global warming with the Unabomber, Ted Kaczynski. Not a particularly subtle approach, um, but an attempt to create an association to, to get us to think of uh, climate, human driven climate change as a sort of crackpot idea. Um, I mentioned Gasland. Gasland has a, a couple of instances, at least in, in it, where we are presented with problems. The most famous is the lighting of the faucet on fire, um, and invited to conclude that the reason that these people have these problems, the reason they can light their faucet on fire is because of fracking nearby. The other, 
prominent example from the movie is a, if you've seen the movie, is a situation where a creek in, uh, out west is bubbling with methane. And you can, if you build a, a cairn of stones with an opening at the top, you can light it and it will operate like a, a you know, permanent flare. Um, we're invited to conclude that that also was the result of fracking that it occurred nearby. Yet the experts uh, tell us uh, that, in fact, both of those situations predated the coming of hydraulic fracturing to, uh, to the area. So uh, an attempt to create associations doesn't come right out and say that there was causation, but an attempt to, to lead us to infer that there, were, that there was causation. Uh, lastly, I want to make a mention, or lastly on this slide, I want to make a mention of how the media sometimes can play into this, this process. Uh, media wants, wants clicks on their websites. They want to, I almost said they want to sell papers, but nobody actually gets a paper anymore. I, I read a paper, but I read it online. Um, uh, so they want, they, they want eyeballs on the set. They want you to buy their paper or their magazine. They want you to click on their website. Uh, and so conflict, controversy is a way to get you to do that. And so often we see um, the media amplifying this conflict, attracted to the extremes, attracted to these claims that are at the extremes. And so um, I'm going to use an example from outside energy, but about a, two or three months ago, maybe it was longer, I got on my news feed, you can't read that, but I'll tell you what it says. On my news feed, I got a headline that said, it involved an Uber cab driver being charged with a sexual assault of a passenger. And it was, turned out it was a headline that was generated at a time when the city in which uh, the, the paper existed was considering whether or not to allow Uber cabs to compete with licensed taxi cabs. The story was from another city, it was from part way around the world from India. And so just on a whim, I, I, I did a Google search on sort of taxi cab driver assaults of passengers for that, and I limited it to that week. And lo and behold, I found all sorts of them, right? I found, not, not, I mean, I'm, I don't mean to impugn taxi cab drivers, I mean, but, but I found these, it, you know, lar law of large numbers, right? We're going to have more assaults, and they, were, if they weren't from Uber cabs, and the headlines didn't mention the company for which they drove. But at a time when there's a fight going on about whether or not to allow Uber, that's a public issue, that kind of headline shows up, right? That uh, reporters are attracted to that, that kind of a headline. And so sometimes uh, these, the, the media can play into this sort of polarization, this, the centrifugal forces that we see in, in these energy policy debates. Um, two other ideas from this literature that I want to mention that affect how we uh, perceive risk. And these relate really to those of you who are interested in sort of paying attention to the studies that are coming out that try to characterize risk. So we're gaining information about risk all the time. They, that information is covered in the press. You can go and read about it. Um, it turns out that we assimilate that new information, we bring it on board, we add it into our decision calculus in a biased way. We often do that in a biased way. There's sort of two competing, or maybe they're complementary, explanations for that. The, psych the psychology explanation is, an, is something called confirmation bias. If we have an inclination or a, a sort of preliminary belief, uh, we tend to want to protect that belief from challenge. We tend to discount information to filter it out that challenges that belief. Uh, that's a phenomenon that's been demonstrated over and over again through experiments. Um, the, cultural or the anthropological um, explanation for all of this is, uh, comes from some work done at Yale University, uh, experimental work again by a guy named Dan Cahan, who's done experiments looking at how we perceive risk, but, based, but he bases his uh, studies on our cultural identity, what we, how we think of ourselves, what we identify as. I'm, an indus I'm a sort of a free market industry person, or I'm an environmentalist. My, what's my identity? Am I a liberal? Am I a conservative? And they say that even if we don't have a prior belief that we want to confirm, according to that work, we do want to have beliefs that are consistent with our people, with the way our people feel about these issues. And he's shown this over and over again. Let me give you an example of an experiment. Um, so uh, he, he has a survey instrument he uses to divide people into sort of by, by ideology, a fairly 
well-tested, reliable survey instrument that, to, that allows you to identify or infer if someone's liberal or conservative. And then he'll show them uh, information, a study. He'll show them a study. Let's say the study shows that uh, the death penalty does indeed deter crime or uh, that global warming is indeed driven by human activity. So two, two different studies. And uh, he asked them, and, and there's a, a CV, a resume, a set of qualifications for the authors of the study. Usually very impressive, you know, MIT and, and so on. Um, and he'll ask respondents, how credible is this expert? And you can predict what, you probably already know where I'm going here. Um, if you're a liberal and you're looking at the death penalty study and it's reached a conclusion you don't like, you don't see that expert as very credible. If you're a conservative, he is credible. Vice versa on the global warming. This, back when he did global warming, it was still a little bit more disputed in the American public. Uh, vice versa on the global warming. People saw uh, whether they determined the credibility of the expert based upon whether the conclusion of the study was the one they wanted to hear. Uh, and so even if, uh, even if we think we know a little bit about something, we can still be subject to these biases as we interpret new and assimilate new information. In the fracking context, I, re I recall, you, know, you don't have to be, this is not a, a function of intelligence uh, necessarily. There are situations in which very intelligent people engage in this same sort of reflexive discounting of new information. Uh, there was a study on, I'm not going to name names, but there was a study on methane leakage from fracking operations uh, that, took, that was conducted here at the University of Texas that reached a relatively optimistic conclusion about the amount of methane that was leaking, at least optimistic compared to the beliefs of fracking, anti-fracking activists. Um, it was dismissed in print by another scholar at another university who admitted in the paper, in the newspaper article that he hadn't read the University of Texas study. So, so it happens to, it happens to, uh, to, uh, to all of us. It's not just a function of sort of laziness or ignorance or something like that. Okay, um, when politics is involved, uh, these problems get ramped up even more, more so. The, the, the appeal to emotion in politics is not a new thing. It's, it is part of the art of politics. These quotations are really just uh, observations by, uh, in one case, a political practitioner, in the other cases, close political observers. Uh, Henry Adams was a grandson and great-grandson of a president, but mainly he was an, a political historian. So was the Louis Namir and uh, David Brooks, uh, columnist in the New York Times. So these, the notion that uh, when, when, is, when policy, when these issues, these issues about risk get mixed up in politics, uh, the appeals to our biases become stronger, more effective, more artful. Politicians are naturally good at this. Uh, you need look no further than the current, the date today's, or last few weeks news in the presidential campaign to see that these appeals to emotion, appeals to bias are everywhere and common uh, and effective. Uh, and these quotations are laments about this process. I mean, these people aren't happy about this, uh, but, um, but they're a fact of life in politics. And they're a fact of life in American politics, especially as uh, we become more polarized. Um, this is a picture of, uh, it's drawn from data trying to measure ideology, the ideology of members of the U.S. House of Representatives by party. The top line uh, is the Republican Party, the median Republican, and the uh, bottom line is the de median Democrat. Um, and uh, you can see that over time, uh, the parties have become more ideologically homogenous and also further apart ideologically. Uh, the, the Y index is sort of an index of conservatism. So as you move up, you're more conservative. As you move down, you're more liberal. Uh, and you'd see a similar picture, perhaps not as pronounced, but similar in the US Senate. And you see the same thing in, in, in the electorate. Polling of the electorate has shown a similar divergence of opinion. So when, the, when ideologies are far apart, the stakes are higher in, in political conflict. And when the stakes are higher, the temptation to want to appeal to these biases are, str are stronger. So the question is, what do you do about it? 
if you're a voter or you're somebody who wants to be intellectually honest, you want to understand these risks, or you want to understand these issues, and it's easier for you to see the bias in the other side, you might conceptually acknowledge that maybe you're susceptible to bias too, but it's hard to admit that and it's hard to deal with that in the heat of the moment or when the, when the policy is being chosen. We can all accept it in other contexts. We all know that when we watch a football game with somebody from the other, that's rooting for the other team from, than, we, than we're rooting for and we see a close call, miraculously our view of the call is always in favor of our favorite team, right? But when it comes to these important issues, it's really hard sometimes to identify this. Well, there's a school of thought that says we can't, we can't insulate ourselves against this. Um, we, that we, could, we should just sit back and enjoy it, feel, feel comfortable in our bias and our hatred of the other side. John mentioned I went to Duke and North Carolina. There's a book about the rivalry between Duke and North Carolina called To Hate Like This Is To Be Happy Forever. <laughs> uh, so that's a recognition of the fact that it's comfortable to indulge these biases. Um, but I assume there's enough people out there that don't want to, don't want to take that approach, that want to try to uh, insulate themselves against these biases. And so, you know, there are certain things we can do. For some of you, these may be intuitive. For some of you, they may not be. Um, maybe you took a course in management or leadership way back when, and you read about the, the things leaders can do to make sure that group decisions are not infected by bias in some way. Well, these, the things we can do as individuals are sort of like you know, being the leader of the group that's in your own brain. <laughs> it's, a, it's, ident it's injecting into your own decision process things that are analogous to the, what leaders inject into decision processes to make them work better. So one of them is you can create your own broader frame. Don't let other people frame the problem for you. Uh, find a, uh, a variety of sources before you reach a decision. Beware of a good story. If a good story beats data every time, beware of a good story. Especially if it really makes you feel comfortable with your, pre, your, sort of, your predisposition. Uh, go and look to see if the story's true. The, the Uber driver example I gave you was an example of that. It took you know, very little time to Google that. Unfortunately, we don't have a Snopes site for energy law where you can go look up all what's true in energy law but you, you can you might take a few more steps than that to to to, to figure it out uh, beware of uh you improve your antenna at identifying situations where people are trying to frame a problem for you in a way that might not be complete um, when they invite you to infer something without actually demonstrating that a caused b uh, be skeptical of that even if it feels good to draw that inference. Uh, statistics can be used misleadingly, misleadingly all the time. Uh, you know, look at how the axes on a graph are labeled. <laughs> uh, think about, um, think about ex uh, statement, expressions that are in percentage terms, for example. I confess, and this is embarrassing, that I was probably 35 before I realized that 2% milk didn't have 98% less fat in it than whole milk did. Right? That was a marketing ploy that, you know, worked on me. You know, it turns out it only has half the fat that whole milk has. So, um, you know, be teach yourself to be skeptical about these things. Develop multiple perspectives. Um, and in the context of our risks, the ones we've been talking about in connection with fracking and, and climate change, uh, let, me t let me mention a couple of things. You can put risks in a broader perspective by looking at other risks and seeing how they compare, right? Now, that doesn't answer your question about what the best policy is, but it helps you understand the risk a little bit better. Uh, and so, um, you know, when we think about energy choices, fuel choices, uh, you know, we can, we can keep the relative risks associated with each fuel choice in mind. It turns out that coal combustion is a lot dirtier than all the other fuels we have. Uh, there, it, has, it may have benefits that we like, and we have to balance those benefits against the costs, but it does in fact lead to premature mortality, according to the best evidence we have, in very large numbers that most people don't realize. An MIT study last, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, nuclear power concluded 
that because of all the coal-fired power plants worldwide that weren't built because nuclear plants existed, 1.8 million lives were saved. That's a big number. Um, but we also have to recognize that we accept a certain, certain risk. Right? When we look at that automobile number, for example, um, or electrocutions in the home, uh, you know, we, re we start to think, well, why do we accept those numbers? Well, because these, these things have tremendous benefits for us. We've decided that benefits matter as well as costs. And so another part of putting things in a larger context is not just to look at relative risk, but to look at what those risks are balanced against, the benefits of the activity that they're associated with. Force yourself, get, you, get in the habit of doing that. Um, final, uh, I'm getting close to wrapping up here, but um, uh, the other thing you can train yourself to do is think about bias in, in, in sources more, uh, more thoroughly. Uh, ask yourself what, what is likely to be the bias of the speaker. What does the EPA want? Well, they have a mission, right? They have a mission of protecting the environment. So their focus is going to be on the environment. What, does, what do bit spokesmen for companies want? Well, they're, they're representing their clients. What do academics want? What is, what is their incentive structure? Ask about the incentives that each party faces and what are the costs to them of being wrong? For an agency, it's uh, you know, being overturned in court. For an academic, it's reputational. Uh, think about the costs of being wrong when assessing you know, the, the source that you're getting information from. Uh, memes. I found these memes online. These keep calm memes are everywhere. Um, but when it comes to the discomfort, I thought they were useful here. I didn't create these. These are, <laughs> these are out there. Um, but when it comes to the sort of emotional discomfort part of trying to avoid bias, you know, one of the things you can do is sort of pat yourself on the back if you get in the habit of, you know, getting comfortable with two opposing ideas in mind simultaneously. Pat yourself on the back for your intellectual honesty. Maybe that'll balance out the discomfort that's associated with having to live with those two opposing ideas. Um, it is, there's an emotional element to all of this. Um, I focused today on risk and environmental sort of risk issues. We see bias in all kinds of other areas within energy policy. Um, depending upon which side of the debate you're on, your optimism about finding technological solutions to problems is selective. So how optimistic are you about finding a technological solution to climate change, say through geoengineering of some kind? Well, if you're on the left, not very. If you're on the right, perhaps a little more. How optimistic are you that we're going to find a solution that will allow us to have 100% renewable power through cheap energy storage? And how fast we'll get to that, that outcome? Well, if you're on the left, pretty optimistic. If you're on the right, not so optimistic. Uh, we see that kind of selective optimism in, in, uh, and, and selective treatment of uncertainty and risk in all sorts of other areas within energy law. And lastly, last slide, I'll end on a note of optimism. I think uh, eventually the, the truth wins out. If the, this, the scientific understanding of risk and the scientific understanding of these factual questions moves toward, or I should say the public debate moves toward the scientific debate over time. That's, it may take a really long time, uh, but even now with climate change, we saw it with acid rain, for example, in the 1980s. We had the same sort of debate over acid rain as we've had over climate change, and, and with climate change, only four or five years ago, less than half the American public thought it was real and driven by humans. Now, a pretty strong majority does. So the, the two per sets of perceptions move closer to one another over time. Um, and you just have to, we just have to be patient and help that, help that process along. I think there probably are lots of other uh, energy policy issues or questions or things that some of you may want to talk about, so I'm going to stop there and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I was going to see if you could talk a little bit about uh, 
risks and benefits of the Clean Power Plan. Uh, the uh, EPA's um, greenhouse gas regulation just came out about a month ago, um, and specifically about, you know, even EPA will say that this plan, even if fully implemented, is not really going to move the needle on climate change worldwide. And how they justify the cost that they're going to incur. Sure. Good question. Um, the Clean Power Plan, uh, for those of you who don't know, will reduce, will regulate emissions from existing coal and gas fired power plants, uh, emissions specifically of greenhouse gas, um, carbon dioxide, and other greenhouse gases. Um, the EPA, as with all its rules, has to prepare a regulatory impact analysis that measures, estimates the costs and benefits of doing that. The majority of the benefits that it has estimated for this for, for this rule are associated with reductions in emissions of pollutants other than greenhouse gases. Um, so that the greenhouse gas emissions are a minority of the total benefits. Um, that wasn't precisely your question. Your question was about how much good this will do in the in the sort of battle to reduce the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and yeah, the, re, the regulatory impact analysis set, shows that it is a relatively small, it's a, marg, you know, a very small percentage of total benefit that we need to bring greenhouse gas concentrations down to the target of, I don't know what the target is now, 400, four, well, it can't be 400, it's got to be 450. In, in Texas, it's like 1,000. Well, I think, I think we're a little over 400 right now, if I'm not mistaken. But, uh, in any case, it, you're right. It's a marginal. It's a marginal impact, and I think part of the uh, part of the rationale for this is that um, the United States grew to wealth by emitting uncontrolled greenhouse gases. The other big emitters, China and India, who are the two big emit other future emitters, um, are not going to do anything until we do something. And uh, so that American action, I think the administration believes, is a predicate to a larger group action that will affect more meaningful reductions. Thank you. Yes. A uh, question about hydraulic fracturing, horizontal drilling. Mm -hmm. uh, the people who are opposed to it point to or assert, among other things, that it leads to contamination of aquifers. And oil and gas drilling, per se, there are risks associated with it. But the use of horizontal drilling and fracturing, even UT studies have shown there are no examples of which I'm aware, and I've looked, where aquifer contamination has resulted from hydraulic fracturing. I mean, just as a practical matter, it occurs so many thousands of feet below the ground, it's, it's not conceivable. And yet that continues to be a concern. How, how do you deal with those types of issues in the press and, and if, if you're representing the industry? Yeah, good question. So the fracking debate um, <clears throat> gets wrapped up in uh, semantics, I think, at times, because sometimes when people say fracking, they refer to the process of fracturing deep underground, and some people refer to the whole process um, from start to finish. And it's, pr uh, I'm not aware of proven exa examples of the creation of fractures, creating ap ap pathways for either methane or fracking fluids to get up to the aquifer, which is much, you know, often mile, a mile or more, uh, above the fracture area. However, there have been examples of poorly constructed wells that have leaked. Um, and then there are people who in, in Pennsylvania where you have something like 200,000 abandoned wells that nobody knows where they are, <laughs> who claim that there's a risk that fractures could connect with these abandoned wells, uh, which were never properly plugged um, and find their way up to the aquifer. Um, there's, a, there's a study out of well, it was originally out of, it's out of Duke, but the guy who was the lead author is now at Stanford, Robert Jackson, you may know him, um, that showed that there was some thermogenic that is deep methane in the water table. That doesn't prove that it came from fracking. It could have come up these abandoned wells on its own, right? Um, but you're, I, I would agree with the sort of g general premise of your question, which I think is that it's a very low probability event it's, and usually results from some kind of human error. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Let's go over here. On a biases on your last point, where you think the truth will eventually uh, kind of come out, these days with the availability of the information out there on the internet, and we have a much easier time, much easier ability to confirm our own biases and, and specifically read 
a set of sources that continue to confirm those biases. And we even have studies that come out that may not be, you know, from the most reputable journals, but they're still touted in those specific media outlets as a, a study um, with no sort of background on how credible they are. Do you think that that's still the case? You, you still believe the truth will eventually win out and we still have that much conflicting information in a public that doesn't know how to separate a really well done study vice, uh, you know, a badly done study, especially when it comes from their preferred media outlet? Yeah, I think that sort of selective media, uh, selective choice of media and sources uh, to confirm our biases exacerbates the problem and makes a, and delays the convergence of sort of popular understanding and, and expert understanding. Um, yeah, you have to want to, you have to want to uh, avoid the bias. Uh, and you're right that the, the, mere, the sort of uh, multiplication of media sources that, are, that have a, a point of view and do some of this, feed our biases by sifting for us um, is a problem. So for example, um, you, know, you see this m perhaps more seriously now in, in fracking as these new studies come out. There's, um, there, are s there are websites on each side that will reflexively attack any study that reaches a conclusion that goes against its interests. Um, one way to handle that sort of is to actually go look at the study. Now, not most, most people don't want to do that. Um, another way is to sort of take a look at the nature of the uh, criticisms that are being leveled against the study and see exactly how uh, powerful you think they are. Uh, but it does, it takes, I think you're right that this exacerbates the problem and it takes effort. I'll give you an example of a, 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 a set of risks that still, where the quantifiable risk is still far away from what the public perceives to be the risk, and that's nuclear power. Um, if I was to put up numbers about the number of, you know, fatalities or premature fatalities from nuclear power over time, uh, peaceful use of nuclear power over time, it would be very small. Um, and if you were to, if you were to discard, it, it, basically the only one, the only accident where we really have a certainty so far that we have fatalities is uh, Chernobyl. Fukushima may, in the end, produce some, but um, in, in the United States, American uh, nuclear power plants, you basically have none except fatalities during construction. And so, but people are, people's perception of that risk is that it's, you know, really, really big. And that's really about the, the dread phenomenon and the magnitude of the risk dwarfing the probability that the risk will happen. That was a rambling answer, but I hope I got to your, yeah. Hi. Hi, I'm, an, I'm actually a dinosaur. I have a petroleum land management degree from the University of Texas. I thought you were gonna say you read, you had a paper, a newspaper delivered <laughs> no. to your house. Okay. No, I do have a newspaper yeah. actually <laughs> in my car. Okay. Uh, so I read papers. Yeah. Um, getting to geologists, all this, the problem to me in all of this is um, you can, geologists agree about as often as economists do. And, and if, if everybody knew where the fracking and uh, the materials and the, whether it was affecting the water or not affecting the water, then they would, uh, the thrill of geology would be gone. And uh, that's not gonna happen anytime soon. But I get my question is much more legal in nature. Um, having been, I am very familiar with the oil and gas lease, and I'm somewhat familiar, I'm not a lawyer, uh, but I did study a lot of law and, and continue to do so. Um, the right to put the waste material back into the ground. I understand the rule of capture and all of that. Under what right in the oil and gas lease and of course there are many, many forms of it, but allows for the introduction of actually an increased amount of liquid back into the formation. So are you asking about the injection, the deep injection of wastewater yes, after? Or absolutely. are you asking about the fact yes. that some of the frac fluid stays down in the hole? No, I'm okay. talking about the injection of wastewater. Yeah, so, uh, Federal law permits uh, deep injection wells for disposal. So it's a federal regulatory program. You may have heard, you know, that fracking is exempt from the Safe Drinking Water Act. Well, it's the, frac the original fraction process is, but the disposal of wastewater is not. And so you have to get a federal permit 
to inject that wastewater deep underground. Uh, that permit program is administered by the states, but it's a federal program. And that's the authority by which underground injection wells are operated. Um, so, so on an individual well, someone who's fracking does not have the right to reinsert waste. Not without a permit. But it has to give them permission in the in the lease too. Oh, in, in, in the either lease, in either case, you have to get the property no owner. You have to get injection. property rights. Yeah. Yeah. They, no, most so of you, the ones I'm looking at now do. They say no injection, well, yes, no sure. disposal. Yeah. Yeah. The reason that f the original fracking operation is om is uh, exempt from the permitting require requirement is because it's not for disposal, right? And so if you start to use that same hole for disposal, you're going to need that federal permit. But you always need the property owner's um, permission. Yes. I apologize, I had one more. Yes, uh, sure. Do you feel the role of, of at least private parties or overall using litigation to shape energy policy has increased or kind of stayed the same? Uh, I don't think it's increased. I think uh, this is America, we litigate. Uh, um, no, in fact, most of, before we had the, the major federal environmental laws, most of the sort of seminal events in environmental protection in the 1960s were big lawsuits. Uh, the environmental groups brought lawsuits and ch changed law that way before they could convince Congress, Congress to change the law. So I don't think there's any increase in the number of lawsuits. It's just there's a famous case in coal mining where the court, the judge starts it by saying, as night follows day, litigation follows rulemaking under this statute. And that's just a fact for most environmental statutes. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you, you then. So I work in climate change mitigation and adaptation. And I find that sometimes when I walk into a room, when I'm dealing with petroleum engineers, that even if I'm prepared and I've done the things that you have done in your talk and put things in context and have um, identified my biases, sometimes I met with the bias of others and some hostility from the get-go. And I was wondering if you had any insights as to how to sort of disarm that when you're trying to have a productive conversation. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, I mean. <laughs> Can you solve this for us quickly? <laughs> yeah. To be fair, you know, so the same thing happens on the other side sometimes, right? So if you're, a, if you're a, say, a fracking company and you go to a public hearing, you're going to meet that same sort of intransigence on the other side. Um, so in both of those situations, I think this is, by the way, this is not law at all. This is just. <laughs> Uh, from my experience sometimes going into those rooms. Um, there's some value, first of all, to um, allowing the other side to vent. Uh, people are ready, are, are ready to listen once they've vented their frustration more than, bef than if you sort of come at them right out of the gate. Um, and then any sort of rhetorical devices you can use to steer the conversation back to that broader perspective as opposed to the frame that they're coming at you with. Um, and uh, so if you can, you know, in the case of climate change, it's often good to get, you know, you, what we're trying to do is narrow, reach agreement on the facts so we can narrow the scope of our disagreement and focus on where that is, right? And so if you can uh, get to the discussion of, you know, exactly where are we disagreeing here? Is it that you don't think climate change is real? Is it that you don't think it's driven by human activity? Or is it that you think this clean power plan is a terrible rule for a lot of other reasons, and, you're, and because of that anger, you're sort of giving me a hard time on these, these factual questions? Is that helpful at all? Yes. OK, good. Hi. My question is um, related to the policy uncertainty. You know, in fact, <clears throat> I've been to a few conferences uh, this year like the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the feedback, actually, the, uh, the industry people were saying that we are looking forward to getting more policy clarity or certainty in terms of you know, all these complex issues. At the same time, the regulators were saying that you know, even though they would like to provide such a clarity, but then you know, they are also handicapped with uh, so many different stakeholders giving their perspectives or biases, what you may call. Do you, what's your take on, you know, uh, if, if, is there any way that we could bring in more clarity or, you know, some of this in the regulatory area? What particular policy are you referring to? Uh, this is mainly the interactions between the, you know, the gas industry with the, you know, uh, gas and the power 
and uh, since the natural gas, gas power coordination. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So this is another issue where one person's clarity is another person's, you know, abominations. Uh, you know, another thing you often hear at energy conferences is the United States has no energy policy. We should have an energy policy. But you hear that from both sides. You know, they, they're thinking of very different things when they when they think of what that energy policy ought to be. Um, when it comes to um, business, does want clarity, right? They want clear legal rules, and to the extent there's ambiguity in the rules, it makes it difficult for them to plan. And the particular issue you're talking about, for those that don't know, involves coordination between gas markets and power markets. And when the win winter of whenever it was that was super cold, maybe it was last winter, uh, up in the Northeast, there was a problem because the gas markets and the electricity markets are not in sync. Uh, they operate at different hours. The gas markets are closed. A lot of times the electricity markets are open. And gas shortages for natural gas power plants in the Northeast arose, not only because of bottlenecks in the system, but because of the ways these markets work. And so the, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission made a big effort to try and coordinate, improve the coordination between those markets. And in that situation, you know, clarity probably was a reference to uh, the, the desire to want to be able to count on natural gas when you expect to receive it, or the ability to buy natural gas on the market. Uh, but yeah, that, outside that context, I don't really have a more general answer for you about clarity. I mean, that sounds like the kind of thing that people can, that sounds like a kind of ambiguous term that, you know, might lead to misunderstanding as often as understanding. Last two questions. Okay, who is first here? Okay, yes. I, I feel like uh, often I hear the stereotype for businesses is that they only care about profit. Like you hear that everywhere. And I'm just, how true is that? Like the, the incentive is profit. We don't care about anything else. And could you give me like a more realistic analysis of how much do they care about whether it's the environment or about their shareholders? Well, that's a huge question. Um, and there's a huge literature on that question. Um, there's a literature on corporate social responsibility that tries to measure the degree to which it's you know, sincere and the degree to which it's window dressing, right? And as a subset of that, there are you know, businesses that organize around a particular social benefit, social enterprises. Um, My, impre my impression of that literature is that um, while not everything that big companies claim to do for the greater good of society is actually a selfless act, more, they do more of that sort of thing than you would predict they would do if it was all about a quantifiable return to the shareholders. Why they do that is, up, is there's sort of competing narratives to explain that. Some might, you know, some, it might be that you know, managers of companies have to live in the community. They care about their reputation. Or maybe they think that they are sort of on, by the seat of their pants, maximizing the long-term benefit for the shareholder by keeping society pleased with what they do. Um, but that's a really, really big question uh, that we have entire courses on in the MBA program. Yeah. Yes, sir. I'm curious to get your thoughts on the economic uh, impact of carbon, if you think there should be a, like a cap and trade or a carbon tax, and if so, do, do you have a price of what you think it might be? <laughs> uh, uh, so the EPA's Clean Power Plan is a, is, was not the first choice of the administration. The first choice was a congressional solution to this, a creation of a cap and trade program that passed the House of Representatives in 2009 and failed in the Senate in 2010. Only after that did the EPA decide to address this problem by rule. Um, the EPA's Clean Power Plan, if it survives, and it's got a lot of legal vulnerabilities associated with it, but if it survives, is designed to encourage a cap and trade system in terms of the, pre which is different from a tax, right? Um, you'll hear people say cap and tax. That's, a, that's, a, that's an attempt at an association, right? That's an attempt to get you to think of it as, about it as a tax so that you won't like it. And, they, and that comes from both the left and the right, though, that cap and tax argument. Um, but uh, in terms of the cost of 
carbon, um, the, e the federal government has chosen a number that all federal agencies use. Um, there's a l extensive literature out there trying to estimate the cost of a ton of greenhouse gas emissions or carbon dioxide equivalent emissions. That literature, as far as last time I looked at it, has an enormous range from something like more than $100 a ton, maybe more than several hundred, I don't know. Uh, but last time I looked, it was like the survey I looked at looked at 100, went from $105 to a, a ton to a few that were at negative. Um, and the median was, you know, I don't know, 25 or 30, something like that. Um, ExxonMobil, last I heard, uses 20, do they, what do they use? Uh, 2020 is carbon, $80. Oh, $80 a ton for 2020. Twenty forty. Okay, so they're using a higher target. Um, there's a lot of uh, uncertainty around those estimates. I mean, there's there's not a, a consensus on that yet. Um, and I don't have a number. I'm not. I don't have an. I don't have the expertise to give you a number. I've heard twelve. I've heard five. Yeah. One hundred and forty-eight. I'm right there with you. Yeah. Thank you. Are we done? Okay. All right. Thank you very much.